The story starts out with a white-haired girl asking a question. A war has broken out with one side having an army of 37,463 soldiers while their opponent has 100,000. Which one do you think would win? She proposes. The other four students are left in silence. Bummed out, the teacher tries to pester the students to at least try to answer the question. One of the yellow-haired cadets raises their hand, answering the first army. She asks for his reason. He answers that 37,463 soldiers, a group that knows its exact force down to the very last soldier, won't lose to a simple army of 100,000. Everyone is left in silence. The teacher congratulates him, saying that he's correct. She then goes on to state that knowledge is mightier than power and only when someone knows that can they become a knight. We then get an explanation of what a knight is in this story. What defines a knight? Honor. Justice. Knights embody these words. They will forfeit their life without a moment's hesitation. For the sake of justice and view an honorable death as a privilege. In this era they are heroes. The teacher, whimpering in a sarcastic manner, asks Najin how he figured out her question. So quickly, Najin doesn't answer back and stays silent. The teacher then goes on to comment how weak they were today and that tomorrow is their big test so they better do well and that she was going easy on them so they should really prepare themselves as tomorrow no one's going to be going easy on them. She then leaves, dismissing her class before stating that everyone has to do a hundred reps of their basic repetition drill before leaving except for Najin since he got her question right. Annoyed, the other cadets look at Najin in jealousy. Clearly being a common occurrence, the teacher glares at them and gives them a warning that they better not start fighting. Again, she then disappears. After her disappearance, the cadets except Najin start to complain about the hundred reps, stressing the idea that they won't be ready for tomorrow if they're so sore. From the training, one of the yellow-haired cadets wakes up loose who seems to have been passed out after getting hit once. Concerned, one of the black-haired cadets asks if Najin is heading home. The other cadets, especially the green-haired girl in jealousy, ask if it must be nice to get a pass. Najin honestly answers back that it sure is. She then yells at him, stating that she watched him during their training. We then get a flashback of when all the cadets except Najin were heading towards the teacher trying to punch her. The teacher, being too fast, manages to analyze all of their movements and counterattack, throwing the incoming punch from the girl to the yellow-haired boy. Then, noticing Luce, she heads straight towards him, punching him and kicking him in his gut. While this is going on, Najin was just staying at the back watching. The girl then complains that Najin should have done something and that he's just watching them. She states that despite him being the strongest one out of them, he's not doing anything and that for a knight, teamwork is vital. Frustrated that Najin is not listening, she tries to punch him, only for the black-haired cadet to stop her. The black-haired cadet then gives her the warning again that Fei Dian won't stand for it and that they will be disqualified if they start fighting again. Fei Dian being the teacher. Not exactly knowing what disqualified means, he states that they should just try not to fight each other. After calming down, she stops. Luce comments that maybe getting punished would be good as he throbs in pain, or maybe some sort of excitement as he blushes. The girl is still frustrated and complains about how Najin was rude but his personality seems to have changed and that he's not doing anything. Despite his team losing, the black-haired boy tries to calm her down, stating that something happened to him and that they all know it, that it'd be weird if he were his same old self, that they should just cut him some slack. Understanding this, the girl calms down. He then comments, the pain that comes from losing your family is more excruciating than you can ever imagine. As we cut back to Najin walking, he sighs, trying to hold his feelings. He bites his lip in frustration. He then comments, it worked. Did anyone notice? There's one fact, everyone knows. Last week, my house went up in flames and my only brother was turned to ash. But there's one fact that not a soul knows. The fact that I am Nagyun and that I killed my brother. Chapter 2 
we see Nagyun getting his ass handed to him. As he comments one week earlier, the day it all happened, as we get a flashback. What we've seen before, the three cadets, the yellow-haired boy, the green-haired girl, and Luce, they all seem to be bullying Nagyun. The girl stating Hoopsie as they continue to beat on him. She then states that after beating his butt, she's tired and that they should just get out, as they proceed to spit on his face while cursing at him. After leaving, Nagyun gets up and rubs his hair which is full of spit. He then comments, I've always hated this village as we see some sort of magazine of what I'm assuming to be his brother. Seeing this, Nagyun tries to buy a copy of the magazine, only for it to get thrown towards his face. He then continues to comment on how everyone seems to look down on him. He then goes on to give a point that due to all the hate he's been receiving, he got used to it, to the point of where he could read people's expressions. He also seems to have gotten good at controlling his own expression. He states that he can't smile nor cry. He needs to maintain an indifferent look so he can be harassed less. Of course, in reality, he does feel the pain, he just doesn't show it. As he flips through the wet magazine, Rising Star, who every night wants to tutor first place, ranked second in night and training, with brightest prospects, most popular in the national pool of knights and training. As he reads all of Najin's accomplishments, from the village of Fire Woodian, Nagyun smiles knowing his brother is doing well. As he states, of course there are times I can't help control my expression. We're then cut to someone stating half Nagyun, confused, asks why. At his job, he complains that he did everything he was told to so why is he receiving half the payment. The employer then states that since he left during working hours, he'll be penalized. Right before Nagyun tries to give an explanation, he states one third, and when Nagyun continues to give his explanation, stating that he was being bullied, the employer again comments. One-fourth, lowering his wage, not wanting to hear his excuses. The employer then goes on to berate him that he's lucky he's the only one willing to hire him. Nagyun, frustrated, accepts it, trying to control his emotions. Apparently he believes he deserves this. Nagyun suddenly hears someone stating there he is. As he glances to look who was talking, a rock gets thrown but misses him. As we see a bunch of other kids trying to bully Nagyun, we then get a flashback as to why he's being treated as such. A decade ago, in this village, I'm no more than a criminal who burned down the village. Continuously flipping through the magazine, he thinks to himself that it should all be over soon. When suddenly Nagyun bumps into someone, apologizing, he tries to stand up. While doing so, someone offers their hand to him. Nagyun, confused, he looks up, and his expression brightens, as it's his brother. Hey Nagyun, you good? As he tries to pick his brother back up, Nagyun comments that unlike himself, his brother went to save the villagers while he stayed behind. He goes on to state that he's the village's hero, and the only person that's left in his family. As we see the black-haired cadet looking at them in silence, Najin questions Nagyun, on what he's holding, presumably a magazine. Before Nagyun can answer him, Najin smiles, stating that it's him on that, and that he feels a bit embarrassed. Sarcastically, Nagyun comments, he didn't notice that it was him in the magazine. Bummed out, Najin continues to comment, you didn't buy it because of me? Nagyun then just jokes around with him, saying he obviously knew it was him. Nagyun then shows him a part of the magazine, Continental Attractions, proclaiming to Najin that it sounds fun, Najin answering back, what about it? Nagyun states that he wants to get out of this village, and that when they were young they talked about going on an adventure, and that if he wouldn't mind going with him to the deserts and the seas. As he continues to talk about his aspirations, you the knight, with me the adventurer, running into one another out there in the world. Nagyun says sure, but obviously his expression says otherwise. Nagyun comments, confused that he's not upset, as he thought he might reject the idea. He then continues to kid around, that he can't cry just because he misses him. While Nagyun continues to kid around, while opening the door to their house, Najin sternly notices something, as we're open to a couple of unknown figures inside their home. Confused, and before Nagyun can even finish his statement, a sword comes hurling towards him but gets stopped. Chapter 3 We see the sword that was hurtling towards Nagyun seems to have been redirected upwards, as Najin stopped it. Nagyun, confused, 
watches as the other intruders converse with one another. The one who blocked the attack is Najin. I see he's quite tough. Nagyun demands an explanation of who they are, and Najin tells him to step back. As Najin proceeds to analyze their movement and the way they attacked, he comes to the conclusion that they must be here for something more than just a scary prank. Najin realizes they must have come to kill him and challenges them. One of the intruders laughs, berating his statement. Sarcastically, they ask him, Maybe we are. If so, will you lay down and die? Najin answers back, You wish, as he prepares for a kick, knocking one of the intruders back and taking their sword. Najin monologues to himself that there are many opponents but he doesn't know who they are, how skilled they are, or if they wield any other weapons. Realizing that the situation is dire, he concludes that it won't be a good idea to enter the room as that would just restrict his movements in a cramped space. Despite knowing this, he still heads in because he doesn't want Nagyun to be in danger and would rather face them head-on than have them endanger Nagyun. Najin then jokes around, stating that his home is a bit messy and that he should take out the trash. We then get a narrative of Najin's decision, which seems to have been the correct one. Nagyun, behind the door, asks Najin to let him in as we see Najin fighting the intruders. One of them manages to scratch him, but without a problem, he continues to fight all of them. Incapacitating them from using their weapons, he tries to attack one of them, but before doing so, another one attacks him. He jumps up, dodging their attack. He comments to himself that due to the tight space, he can't get a nice attack in, and that besides one of the dudes with the diamond emblem on his head, everyone else is pretty easy. While analyzing the situation, he glances around, noticing the leader who's just analyzing Najin's movements. Najin starts to feel worried as their leader hasn't made a move. Suddenly, the leader comments on his strength, admitting he had underestimated him. Deciding to make a move, as he can't let the fight drag on, he prepares to attack, and Najin gets ready to counteract it. Before he could attack, the leader glances towards Nagyun's direction, who continues to bang on the door. Najin, noticing this, realizes that they're about to attack Nagyun. While at the other side of the door, Najin shouts that he'll go get help, when suddenly the door gets cut open, and he notices Najin, who's bruised up from blocking the attack. While doing this, the narrator comments that making the right decision doesn't always mean that you win. The leader compliments his strength, surprised that he could block such an attack. Getting ready to attack another time, he asks whether he can take another blow or would he rather dodge it. I can't wait to find out as he gives another slash, in which Najin prepares to block the incoming attack. Although successful at blocking the strike from the leader, Najin seems to be down for the count as his back is heavily injured. Nagyun, worried, shouts to Najin. While the leader thinks to himself, noticing his mask is scratched up, he still tried to attack, as we see the sword stuck behind the wall. He opted for a guaranteed defense over a guaranteed attack. As we see Nagyun panicking and commenting on Najin's actions, that he should have prioritized his own safety. While all of this is going on, one of the leader's subordinates asks him to hurry it up, as they don't have time, when the leader comments, Family. The leader heads towards Najin and Nagyun and gives them a sword with the choice for Nagyun to survive as long as he kills Najin. Nagyun, surprised and terrified, starts reminiscing about their times together. Najin and I were twin brothers. Unlike most siblings, we were always the best of friends. Najin was a bit of a wimp when he was little. When the other kids would push him around, I would come running to save him. I'm sorry, Nagyun. It's all my fault. We see Najin whimpering, as Nagyun shouts, asking him to not apologize and that this is what brothers do. They protect each other. As we see Najin, whose chest is pierced through by a sword. There's a secret that not a soul knows as Nagyun lets go of the sword. Condemned with guilt, he looks at his hand, which is covered in Nagyun's blood. The truth is that I'm Nagyun as he glances at Najin's dead body, and I killed my own brother. Chapter 4 Kill Nagyun and I'll let you live. The leader proposes. Nagyun, confused and terrified, complains to them why they're doing this to him and his brother, and that he'd rather take them on than kill his only family. Contemplating that idea, the leader questions his resolve as he gets ready to attack him. Najin, 
Noticing the dire situation, closes his eyes. Nagyun tries to reassure Najin that he'll be able to hold them off until help arrives. Najin, disagreeing with the idea, staggeringly gets up, asking Nagyun to stop. As Najin thinks to himself that Nagyun won't have a chance against them, he contemplates that they can't both die. Contemplating that idea, he grabs Nagyun's hand and stabs himself so Nagyun doesn't have to die. Shocked at what just happened, Nagyun looks at his brother as he notices he stabbed him. Najin, while coughing up blood, holds his brother's hand. Trying to comment something, he falls. The intruders, done with their goal, leave, but not without stating. Wudian's flame has been extinguished, only ash remains. As we see some sort of paper burning up in flames, Najin falling on his knees, cries, thinking to himself, why? How did all this happen? With his dead brother's body next to him, did Najin have to die? As he thinks back, I'll take care of anyone who pushes you around. You are my one and only family after all. Remembering that moment Nagyun, with an angered expression, comes to a resolve. No. Cutting his hair, I won't let it end like this, and ties the back of his hair, making himself look like Najin. The one who died today was Najin. As he calls out his brother's name, from now on, I hope you don't mind if I borrow your name, I will be Najin. We're then cut back to when Nagyun was heading back home, seeing his destroyed house. Thinking back to the intruders, he remembers how there were five of them, that their mission was to kill Najin, although not knowing why that was the case. He doesn't question it, rather doesn't care either, as he just wants to get revenge. He contemplates to himself, how he's supposed to get revenge on a bunch of bandits he doesn't even know the faces of. But he realizes that that won't be an issue, since as long as he lives as Najin, they'll come looking for him eventually, thinking that he survived. He comes to see a problem, as he remembers back to what the intruders were talking about. Assuming that the diamond masked person knew who Najin was, as he talked like he knew him, Nagyun thinks to himself, he was even guiding them, while continuing to come up with a plan, when suddenly someone comments, What a waste! Nagyun surprised looks back that means the Diamond Mask knew Najin in real life. As we see the teacher commenting, I mean Nagyun, that is, what a waste! Analyzing her words, Nagyun thinks to himself, What a waste! Not even what a shame! He inquires, What do you mean? The teacher then goes on to state that everyone bullied Nagyun because of how weak he was, but she, on the other hand, thought he had potential in other areas, and that she had hope for him. So she goes on to restate what she said, and that it's a real waste he died. Nagyun, not knowing what this means, still tries to understand what she's implying. He then contemplates the idea that maybe the Diamond Masked Intruder could be his teacher, the Knight White Dove Fadion. Assuming that she could be one of the intruders, he gets ready to slash her, when out of nowhere, she flash steps closer and notices his sword, complimenting it, inquiring where he got such a weapon. Thinking that maybe he bought it, Nagyun answers that it was rather a gift. Nagyun continues to think to himself, maybe she's testing him, speculating that White Dove could be the intruder as she's questioning him. But he soon lets go of the idea as he concludes that she's too strong, that Najin wouldn't have been able to block her attack like he did back then. So there's no way White Dove could be the intruder. Nagyun then questions why she's here, and that he doubts she was just here to compliment his sword. She then laughs it off and asks Najin to lighten up. Nagyun then finally comes to the idea that White Dove can't be the intruder. What is it? Another weird joke? As White Dove places her hand around Nagyun's shoulder, you're doing your best, Nagyun. Nagyun comes to a surprise and terror, realizing that his very own teacher broke through his disguise. Chapter 5. You're doing your best, Nagyun. White Doe remarks. Nagyun then thinks to himself, she knows? Since when? From the start? If so, then does that mean White Doe is the one who killed Najin? No, maybe she's just testing me. Either way, Nagyun tries to feign ignorance. Excuse me? Trying to imitate Najin, and even repeatedly telling himself that he's Najin right now, and that he has to be Najin. I can fool anyone. Even if they doubt me, there's no proof. As we see White Doe laughing, complimenting his realistic imitation. 
that's a spot on Najin. The way you look or even talk, down to that blank look of confusion, it's perfect. If you had corrected me, then that would make me think you're not Najin. That was a great response. Oh, okay. As Nagyun answers back, she knows. She's sure of it. She's talking to me like it's obvious to her that I'm Nagyun. How is that possible? It's not easy to fool someone who's certain you're not who you say you are. How exactly am I supposed to? She then tells him to relax, reminding him that she's only here because there was something she had to say. She then remarks that he's doing a sloppy job and that he's not meant to become Najin. Suddenly grasping his mouth, Nagyun, terrified as his eyes widen, considers it a piece of advice as she lets go of her grasp and leaves. Nagyun's puzzled of what just happened. As he sweats coldly and thinks to himself, what am I supposed to do? How did someone already figure out who I am? Luckily, it doesn't seem like she's going to tell anyone. What did she mean by her advice? You're not meant to become Najin. As he confusedly analyzes back to what she said, he contemplates whether he should trust her. He continues to analyze the events that just occurred. He knows that he acted apart, but he's still confused as to how she knew he was not Najin. And he notices that her tone of voice wasn't outright threatening, but it was intimidating. Although he knows she's not the one who killed Najin, he still suspects her. With that in mind, he re-strengthens his resolve by beating the idea that vengeance is what's important, that he'll figure it out one way or another. The next morning, we see White Doe greeting everyone for their exam. Most of them, except Nagyun, are not happy. As the green-haired girl comments, seeing her excited makes me nervous. Same, responds the yellow-haired cadet. Angered, White Doe stomps the ground. That was a rhetorical question. She then sets out the rules. Here's the deal. Those who pass are promoted from knight in training to apprentices. Once you're a knight apprentice, you're no longer a civilian. Oh, and one important thing to know, I can't get into all the nitty-gritty right now, but put simply, you might die. She gives out a warning. Who has questions? As we see the cadets all in silence. Who wants to throw in the towel? Seeing that nobody wants to give up, she then starts the exam. The knight's apprentice examination shall commence as we see another person behind them, introducing themselves. I am the knight known as Rosewood Fox Ludica, her weapon being some sort of an umbrella. I was sent to carry out the Northern Knight's apprenticeship exam. I look forward to working with you. As Doe remarks her interruption, stating that she interrupted her, continuing to berate her. Hey, crybaby. I was talking. Why'd you interrupt? Ludica, in response while crying, answers, haven't I told you not to call me crybaby? Angered, Doe answers back, don't cry now. As they continue arguing back, the green-haired girl cadet and Luce infer about what the test could be. Luce speculates that it's maybe a test of strength and that maybe she'll pass one of them based on that. The green-haired cadet then remarks that Najin would then be at the top. We're then cut back to Nagyun's perspective, who monologues to himself. Are they here now, the culprit? They just might be, so I should go through them one by one. Just before proceeding with his plan, the black-haired cadet pops up. You doing all right? Questioning his well-being, Nagyun, startled, inquires what he means, whether he looks off or something. Worried that maybe his disguise is falling apart, and whether there's something about him that throws people off. But then the black-haired cadet answers back, stating that he just looks so calm and relaxed, so he thought something happened. Since his brother died, he might be pushing himself a bit too hard. Nagyun, realizing it's nothing to worry about, responded back. It's not that. When suddenly Nagyun remembers back to what White Doe was implying when she stated, You're not meant to become Nagyun. Was that what she meant? Then, we see the green-haired girl raising their hand, inquiring the components of the exam. White Doe comments that they must be stoked when in reality they're just nervous and anxious. Finally, White Doe starts explaining her role and what the test would be on, going on to explain that she'll just be proctoring the exam's examiner, meaning she'll just step in and stop the examiner when it looks like she might kill them. So in short, she'll basically be stopping Ludica if she goes too overboard, reassuring them that they don't have to worry about getting killed during the exam. This, in turn, makes the cadets even more anxious. 
White Doe further goes on to state that the apprenticeship exam will last for three days, and that the test itself will be to defeat a knight, as we see Ludica challenging which of the foolish cadets will come at her first. White Doe then continues to comment that Ludica won't be going easy on them like she did, and that they should resolve themselves. She then goes on to comment that Ludica is of a much higher beast than she is, further lessening the confidence of the cadets. Thank you for watching. Comment, like, and subscribe if you enjoyed. And go support the author by reading their work.